And I guess that comes up to me. Um, my name is Scott Davis. I'm a founder and CEO of Conquer. And tonight, what I'm going to show you tonight is basically how Conquer is leveraging Xamarin Forms. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Conquer in a minute. But the high level summary is that uh, we're about 95% code we use using Xamarin Forms. We have uh, most of what's not reusable because of maps. Maps are really hard to do cross platform and Xamarin is cross platform mapping solution is obviously not very good. And so we are uh, doing our own implementation natively in each platform for maps, and that's the part of the reason why we're not you know, 90 to 99% cross platform with Xamarin Forms. Uh, our, uh, the, the game, well, let me give you, I'm going to show you our 30 second trailer video because we spent a lot of money on it. the Mac is still going to work when we have to switch over. So I'm going to have to switch back and forth to the Mac. An invisible war is raging all around you. No one knows where the artificial intelligence came from, but we know it's called Conquer. Some seek to destroy it before it destroys us. Others believe it will usher us into the future, and some plan to bend it to their own purposes. Enlist today. Battle for your hometown. Save the world. So that's Conquer. Um, in a twist of irony here, I'm talking about how to make things look nice with a PowerPoint presentation that's absolutely hideous. <laughs> um, but that's because the PowerPoint presentation was built by a dev, not a designer. Um, so a summary, here's my opinion on Xamarin. You may hold a different opinion, but Xamarin is not easier than building one app on any of these platforms, but it is easier than trying to build an app on all three. Um, today, we have Conquer on iOS and Windows Phone, and we have a beta that has about 1,000 registered beta testers on Android. Uh, we were never able to get enough confidence in our Java code to release it to the open public. Uh, every time we touched it, something broke. And um, I'm not going to get into why that happened. But um, today, if you want to download Conquer out there, you'll be running the native code that's either C Sharp Windows Phone or um, Objective-C iOS. If you have an Android and you really want to try out uh, an app that's OK, if you're willing to really bang your head on the wall, uh, you can download the Java version. If you email our support, we'll put you in the beta. Um, an interesting footnote before I move on here, anybody want to guess what our revenue breakdown is between Windows Phone and iOS, percentage-wise? 95 95% <laughs> what, iOS? <laughs> yeah, no, Windows. <laughs> Two-thirds of our revenue is Windows Phone. Uh, 
Uh, bigger fish, smaller it, it has everything to do with discoverability. Um, we heard from a lot of investors, potential investors, we never raised money, and industry experts who said that we were wasting our time on Windows Phone and that we should put all of our resources into iOS. Um, Chip Peterson, I don't know if any of you know him, he's a, a games guy in the Twin Cities, and he told me last time I talked to him that 600 new games hit iTunes every day. And if you're an indie studio, you've got no shot. You, you have to be struck by lightning. Now, we sort of were struck by lightning. I'm not going to say that we were super smart. We were really lucky. Um, but competing as an indie in, a, in an environment where you have 600 new competitors every single day and people with million-dollar marketing budgets like Game of War is a really impossible place to, to, to do well, um, unless you are very lucky. Um, and so what these experts failed to realize is that their advice was good advice if it came with a million-dollar check. Um, if it didn't come with a million dollar check, giving you the opportunity to spend tens of thousands of dollars a month to market your app, it was really terrible advice. And we would have died um, long ago had we listened to them. Uh, we pushed out our Windows Phone app, and uh, every Windows Phone user knows 30 iOS users. It can cost you tens of thousands of dollars a month to get an iOS users. It can cost you nothing to get a Windows Phone user. And in turn, if you have recruitment or social sharing in your app like ours do, all of my Windows Phone users got me all of my very expensive iOS users through referrals and recruitment. Um, and so you could take that same amount of money, be in two platforms, and get the same number of users and potentially even more. So anyway, that was my little soapbox about Windows Phone. Um, it's been very good to us, and actually is the only reason why we're still in business. Hey, Scott? Yeah. Did you build some in-app marketing? That to when you capture your hometown, you can tweet or share on Facebook that you captured your hometown. Um, and that's really, who asked that question? I didn't even see. Um, that, that's how we got all of our traction. We, our beta, we launched our beta at South by Southwest. Boy, this is going to go really long. How much time do I have here? As much as you want. As much as I want. You guys feel free to leave whenever you are tired of listening. Uh, Conquer was a startup weekend project. Startup weekend, you build a company in 48 hours, and that's kind of how Conquer happened. It was an accidental company. Uh, we all thought this was a fun thing, and it turned out to be a, a real company. And uh, we launched our beta, which was an HTML5 piece of crap, um, at South by Southwest in 2011. And we had an eight-foot table and three bad posters printed at Kinko's. And next to us was PlayStation 3 booth with Thor and Dolby surround and multiple huge flat screens. And anybody that would walk by would say, hey, can we tell you about our, our mobile game? And we'd show them our beta. And we had that booth for three days. And in three days, at the end of three days, players had captured their cities in uh, 20 states, 10 countries on four continents. No marketing, no PR, an eight-foot table. It had everything to do with when you captured your hometown, you could tweet, and people were tweeting, I just captured San Antonio for the faceless. And one of their friends would say, what? How did you do that? They click the link, they go, they'd sign up, and they'd play. And that um, has everything to do with how we got our initial base. I'm not going to say viral. That's a really bad word. I'm going to say social spread. Um, that's how we got um, our traction, and that's everything that we've done today has been through that. We've spent, um, I would say, less than $400 in three years on marketing. <clears throat> it's a freemium app. Uh, the app is totally free. We make all of our revenue on four and a half percent of our players. Um, so, if it seems like I'm being really negative here, um, that's not my intention. We are we're doing Xamarin, and we're we think we've made the right decision with Xamarin. Um, you guys are devs; you need to know the pitfalls. And so, I'm here to tell you about the pitfalls. Don't don't take that as negativity too much. Um, I already kind of give you the the review here. Um, everybody that works at Conquer becomes a comic book character. Uh, here are the people that work at Conquer. This is my partner, Justin. Um, these are our three employees who are on payroll. Um, this is, I mentioned, uh, who plays Conquer. Everything in green is the place where somebody has played Conquer. Uh, these are our three faction leaders. We have uh, three comic books that we're building simultaneously, one for each faction. Uh, this is a marketing scheme. We can talk about marketing later if you really want to, but this was my uh, marketing idea of how to boost revenue, and it has worked really well. Um, this is what Conquer looks like today. It's, uh, and I'm going to show you what our 2.0 version is going to look like if we rewrite in Xamarin. Uh, we were able to pull in, at first, about 40% of our Windows Phone code into the Xamarin project. 
we probably rewritten about half of that. So we only leveraged about 20% of our existing mobile platform into Xamarin. Along with that, um, this is kind of an attempt to be mature as a software company, and we did about a 75% rewrite of our server code. We're running in Azure. We have multiple virtual machines, multiple databases, queues, tables, storage. Um, we have a very heavy backend in Azure to support our game as well. Um, so one of the things I think will be very helpful to you is understanding how we broke down this project. This is a rather large mobile code base with what we're trying to do. And the way that we architected our project is probably unique, certainly not something you're going to see in the samples. By the way, a uh, scale of one to five, five being an I'm an expert and one being I'm brand new. Uh, Xamarin developers are a five, super experts. Xamarin developers are a four, three, two, okay, one. Once, okay, so um, that helps me gauge what I should say and what you guys probably already know. In Xamarin, you always have the top platform, the top projects in your solution being platform specific. Um, and below that, generally, you, uh, the samples you'll see will be just one solution. We broke our solution down a little bit further for a couple of reasons. Um, this one right here, this is our localization. All it has is a .NET RX file. That's it. Um, I did this for a couple of reasons. One is if you've ever messed with RX files manually, you know how easy they are to screw up. Um, and I didn't want an obfuscator messing with our X file, our X file. And quite honestly, what do I care if some hacker rips apart our binary and finds all the strings that they're going to see in this in, in the game anyway? And so, uh, just to take that off the table as an obfuscation issue, uh, we made that a separate project. And um, hopefully, someday this will be completely generated um, by a translation app that we're, we need to build in order to localize our app. How many languages? Right now it's just English, but the entire idea is that we want to localize it. And I have players who send me a gigantic Excel file saying, we've taken every single thing we've seen in the game and we've localized it into German. Could you please make us a German app? Um, and we've had the same thing for Portuguese. We've had players send us a Portuguese. And I've said, you know, it's not just about the translation. That's actually the easy part. It's the managing um, of all the languages. And we do plan to do that. We do plan to crowdsource it. Uh, we have every confidence that it should be really quick to get it localized into um, a lot of the bigger languages because of our player base. Our Thai players actually, um, Taiwan is the, or Thailand is the number one non-speaking English country for us. It's, we've been featured multiple times in every English speaking, primary English speaking country in the world on the Microsoft store. But Thailand is the only one. No, that's not true. We've been in Germany and Spain now too. Um, but we've been featured in Thailand, um, and it was our number one biggest download on iOS and our number two biggest download day on Windows Phone is when a Thai blogger blogged about Conquer. Um, it, it was crazy. So we have a lot of Thai players. Uh, Conquer.ClientiCore is pure, pure PCL. There's not one reference in there to anything other than JSON.net. Um, this DLL here has no references to Xamarin. It has no references to anything platform. And we did this so that we would have no issues with our unit testing framework, all of our service layer, our view models, everything, all of our helper codes that do um, string formatting or anything like that. This is in client at core, and we did that so that we would have a unit testable project that had no dependencies on anything else um, that could potentially cause a problem with unit testing. And then finally, we have our, our UI layer here. This is everything Xamarin, Xamarin Forms. Um, so all of our UI views that we draw on the page live inside of conquer.client.ui. And for the most part, this is just the MVC, MVVM type of wiring that plugs in this UI and needs this component. And we, we build that all right here. This division, I'm not going to say hasn't created any problems for us because it has, but um, mostly only in obfuscation issues. Um, for the most part, the, this solution has worked very well for us. And it might be something you want to consider when you set up your apps. Um, of the guys that are doing, yes, go ahead. Did you use the MVVM stuff that Xamarin Forms gives you, or did you? No. No, we built our own. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about frameworks as we get going here. Um, the number one thing for us is we started doing some XAML. We really struggled with the XAML. Um, I really want XAML. I'm a Windows Phone developer. I really want XAML. Um, 
Xamarin's just not mature enough. It wasn't at the time when we made that decision. Even today, I'm going to say that it's just quite not there yet. The fact that we don't have a UI designer besides sketches on iOS is a big flag to me that XAML is just not there yet. If you look out on the Xamarin forums, you'll find lots of uh, comments about how XAML is just not very performant, and you take a pretty big performance hit um, if you use XAML. And so we made the decision rather early on that as painful as it is for us to have to read code to see what the UI is going to look like, we decided to do everything in the code, in the code behind. Um, may or may not have been the right decision long term, but for where, where we were when we started this, it, I believe it was the uh, right decision. Um, as a result, though, it's very hard, right? Looking at markup, you can kind of get an idea of what this thing's going to look like. It's very hard to get an idea of what it is someone else did if you're looking at their code to build UI. Um, so my advice is to break page construction into smaller methods and, uh, and separate the building of the UI from the binding of the UI. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, this is hard to see, but this is the header of all of our UIs. In all of our UIs, we describe the Z layer of how the page is going to be built out, or the top down as well. And so we have a list of all the, basically the container controls, and this is our most complex page. Um, the zone preview stack, then the bot energy stack, then the bottom panel stack, then the forts view, then these menu views. So that you as a developer, because you don't have markup to look at, can kind of get this roadmap of, I know what these things are because the names kind of make sense to me. I see where they live in the layers. And then what we also do is uh, we build the page as little, little uh, methods that sort of correspond to this. Set up the bottom HUD, set up the resource mode, set up the menu, set up the right panel. And we put these into smaller methods so it's easier for us to go find what we're looking for when we see that a click event's not quite working right or something's obscuring a tap event and it's not getting through to the bottom piece. Um, it took us quite a while to kind of come up with this scheme, but once we did, um, there's only two Xamarin, myself and my junior developer. There's only the two of us that are writing code, and it was still really hard for us to communicate where does this happen, what am I looking for, until we started doing this. And then we really didn't need to talk to each other anymore about where is this at or how do I, how do I get to this object. Yes? Uh, you know, I saw that you were doing all the calls there in on size change. Is that because you're also doing uh, uh, landscape layouts? Or what um, we had a problem. We were having a problem. I don't recall exactly what it was. It might have been with the size of the screen or, or something was going on. And what we found was that if we, if we set the on-screen size change and then we made sure we only rendered one time, that the, the screen was a little bit more ready for us to deal with. I honestly cannot remember why we did that, but rather than doing it in the constructor, um, and we still do some things in the constructor for our smaller controls, but this is our, our main page. And so I, there may have been a problem with the, main, the first page not being ready yet, and so we put it on size change. And, um, and then we checked to make sure that we only rendered it one time, and that solved one of our issues. I don't know if that was a weird, quirky thing with some version of Xamarin or not. That's a good question, though. Um, something to consider is that here, if you're having problems in a constructor, try this and just put a flag so you, you don't re-render more than once. Um, with layouts, you want to try to have as few layouts as possible. This can be really, really difficult to do, but when... Um, HTML guys in here with like 300 nested divs, right? That's a really bad thing to do in Xamarin. Um, you want to try to have as few layers as you can possibly get by having. Um, according to Xamarin, uh, the forums out there, you'll, they, they s report that using a grid or an absolute layout are faster than using the linear and relative layouts. Um, and it has to do with the number of measures. Supposedly, with these, the grid and the absolute layouts, you have one fewer measure of the entire page when you're trying to uh, associate things. And with the stack panel and the, what's the other one, relative layout, uh, you have, they have to measure the controls at least one more time in order to make sure everything's positioned correctly. Um, another thing that I'll, I'll say, and we hit this a little bit with, with our code, is that we would say, okay, let's start with Android first on this particular page. Let's start with iOS first on this page. And then you'd say, okay, it's working, it's perfect. And then you try to do it on Windows Phone or on iOS, and then things just didn't work. Um, a lot of big enterprise companies will do this. They'll take their iOS app, 
and they'll say, okay, now let's make it work for Android. And if you're not doing these things in parallel, you're going to end up going back and doing a lot of rework. At least that's my experience. And so when you're designing your page and you're thinking about how things want to work, um, this is especially true with back buttons. If you're not managing your, your pop-up windows and understanding how those are going to work on all of your platforms, how the back button is going to change the behavior of your app, uh, you're probably going to be in trouble. The other thing that is kind of common sense, but we as developers sometimes don't push back enough on, is to set clear guidelines for the designer. Um, these are things that are really easy to do in Xamarin. These are things that we're going to kill us if we have to do it. They're possible, right? We as developers never say it's impossible. Um, but they're really expensive. And I, and I don't know if I have this at a later slide or not, but I give a talk on managing tech teams, and I encourage you guys that are developers to speak ROI. Talk about the, the issues of, is this worth $300? Is this worth two grand? Because if you can equate without giving up what your salary costs, you know, just say, hey, you know, I get the fact that you want this look and feel with this crazy bubble thing on a drop down, um, but is that worth a week? Because that's what it's going to take to build. Um, the people that are giving you directions of what to do um, speak ROI really well of this is awesome, but not worth a week's worth of development time. And I really encourage you to push back up the chain to your designers and your business analysts. Um, and not saying we can't do that or we don't want to do that, but speak ROI in terms of, I can do that, but is it worth X, Y, Z? You'll get a lot more traction that way. Uh, people will start listening to you if you can start speaking ROI, um, and it's really valuable. Me, kind of as the CEO, I carry the big stick, sort of, so to speak, um, with my designer, and I say, no, we're not doing that. We need to find a better way. And I have a great designer. He's amazing. He does awesome things for us, and he's super, super flexible. Um, I have more leeway than you may have in your job, but I encourage you to say, here are the things that are really easy, and here are the things that are hard. And um, here's, a, here's a sample of the old app and the new app. And one of the things that we struggle with with the old app is, look how close all the text is. How are we ever going to localize that? Right? How are we ever going to get that in German or Russian? Um, it's not going to work very well. Where in the new app, we start putting things on individual lines. Uh, we start using more iconography to support localization. And if you don't talk to your designers about how difficult it is to do responsive UI for Android, and they're just used to their iPhone, and they got two iPhones. There's this size and they're that. There's this size. And they don't think about, um, they don't think about the complexity of Android or localization. Um, you're going to run into problems. So start laying that groundwork with your designers and your business analysts up front. Here's another thing that's uh, a very, very strong tip that I can help you with that'll help, um, that'll help you speak your designer's language. Uh, this was our first initial design for launching your formation. This wheel rotates, and when I switch over to the Mac, I'll show you how this works at the end. I'll kind of give you a here's, a, here's the new version of Conquer. And so this is a wheel, and this is like your chamber. So you're going to fire your weapon, and so you flick the wheel, and, or you tap this thing, and it rotates into the timber, uh, chamber, and it fires, and this is freaking awesome. Right? This looks cool. Uh, our players are going to love the fact that they can kind of play a Russian roulette with their formations and, and launch into a zone. But from a UI standpoint, from a responsive standpoint, wow, this is really, really hard. This, on the other hand, is much easier, and, and we've got a variation of this now in the game. And this is easier for us to do as a developer because it's a grid. Right? There's a column. There's rows. Um, these are things that makes, makes it very easy for us to do because in responsive design when the screen could be any size, getting this chamber and this circle to line up through the center of this circle here, really, really hard thing to do. If you go to your designer and say, don't break the grid, they know what that means. Designers understand how to do grid layout. They know how to delay things out in the grid. And if you give them that um, requirement of, hey, it's really easy for us to do stuff if you, do, if you obey the grid, um, that's a way that you can guide your designers to give you nice looking stuff that's easier to implement than something like this. This breaks the grid. Um, this is a tip that I got from Steve, right? You gave this presentation. Um, we've used this here if you use the reveal app. Um, if you design for Android, all your taps will go right through to the bottom. As soon as you try to do it on iOS or especially Windows Phone, your taps will be stopped at the very first thing it hits. 
Um, Reveal app will help you find those layers uh, that are on top that are stopping your taps and your gestures from going through. Um, here's some other tools that I highly recommend. Anybody know John Sheehan? Uh, he's in San Francisco now. He's got this startup called RunScope. Uh, we used RunScope a lot, actually, until recently. He had a partner with a product called Passageway, um, and that Passageway app is gone. Uh, RunScope is still really valuable if you want to uh, monitor your API, and you can also do replay without actually hitting the endpoint of the API. So if you're trying to figure out what in the world is going on with my API call, you can run it through RunScope and you can investigate the request and the response and see what in the world it's doing. But if you're hitting up against a metered API, let's say you're building an app that's talking to some public weather API, but you can only hit that weather API once a minute, no developer is going to want to wait 60 seconds every time they want to test their code. Um, you can run it through WebScope, web RunScope, hit that public API, and then ask for the replay so you get the exact same response back every time, and you don't have to worry about hitting your API throttle limits. Um, I would definitely check out RunScope. They have free plans that, are, that work for most people. The other thing you can use RunScope for is API monitoring, so they can watch your API, but they can also do um, API reporting, so they can see how often, uh, how the response is working in terms of timing. Uh, if you wanted to, you could push uh, a data app out to your customers, having it still run through RunScope. I wouldn't do that for production. Um, but then you can see the usability of your API, and you might say, whoa, why are we hitting this API over and over and over again? We must have an error, a bug in our code because we're hitting this one call way too many times. Um, why is that happening? Steve also mentioned Mr. Jesters in his presentation. Uh, we have not implemented Mr. Jesters yet. Our wheel is a custom gesturing. Um, I think there's a good chance we're going to be adding Mr. Jesters here. Um, as we put more polish on our app. Uh, recently, I have two new ones here that I want to recommend. Hockey app. You guys heard of Hockey app? You guys are all using it? Okay, you love it, right? Um, immediate builds that you can push. You don't have to wait for the two hours for um, Android or Windows Phone and God knows how long for iTunes. Um, and so you've got that ad hoc deployment, sort of like Test Flight. The other nice thing about this is Apple broke Test Flight. It only runs on iOS 8 and above now. Um, this supposedly will go all the way back to iOS 4, certainly iOS 6. Um, it says iOS 4, but when I did it for iOS, I can only get down to 6, and I don't know why, maybe it's some of the libraries I had. But Hockey App gets us back to the point where we can finally start testing on legacy devices again, um, where Apple broke that when they, they took over test flight. And this one, Ingrock. Um, I could absolutely not build software without this or um, Runscope's old tool called Passageway. Um, what you can do with NGRAC here is uh, there's a command line tool. Uh, let me show you here. If I go into my server project, I've got a little tools folder in here. And I set up this batch command. Oh, that's for the chat server. Uh, edit. So I've got this little... It runs ngrok, http subdomain scott-web-conquer-com, and this port number, this is my local port number. When I run this, this basically creates a pass-through at this domain. And so now I can deploy to, I can have my iOS running through Xamarin, running on a phone, talking to my Visual Studio, running on my PC through this portal. And so I can debug through the iPhone then hit a breakpoint on the server, debug to the server, then come back and debug on the iOS. That's amazing, right? Uh, when, when something's just not working, why am I not giving my request? I don't know if it's a request, I don't know if it's a response. Um, this will allow you, without having to mess with your firewall or anything, this will allow you to walk Xamarin code in Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio, and then walk code on the server, and then walk it back on the client. Do you have multiple versions of Visual Studio? If you want to run on the same PC, so what we do, I do a lot for Android and, um, in, and our web, web API. You have two versions of Visual Studio running, one running the Android through Visual Studio talking to a real device or the emulator, and the other one's got your web code running, and then, yeah, then you can run it. We also use SignalR because we have a chat service, so I actually sometimes have three servers, three Visual Studios running, one running our chat API, one running our web API, and one running... Um, the Android client code, all on the same PC. Works just fine. Would, would IntelliTrace work? You know, like, 
Intellitrace? Um, well, you won't be able to go backwards across the network, but you would be able to you talk about historical um, That should all work within the same Visual Studio, but it wouldn't cross the network boundary. Because you're, you're running three copies or two copies of Visual Studio. Um, so anyway, in Grok, um, when, when RunScope lost Passageway, which is what we had been using, I really need to find a substitute, and we found in Grok, and I highly recommend it. They have a free plan, but you can only run one uh, connection at a time in the free plan, and I think only HTTP. Because we have a web API and a chat API, we needed two, so I bought the plan, and I think it was 100 bucks for the whole year. So, what makes that network name visible to your iOS devices? That's um, it, it sets, you go through ingrok.io, so the URL that you would put in your co client code, here, let me show you the client code here, this is the client code, um, you do have to have control of your client, right, you have to change the endpoint on your client, um, but if I look at where we set up our endpoint, whoop, I just had it, where'd it go? Um... Where is it? There. So this is to Cole's machine. So http slash cole-web.congrat.ingrok.io. So what this is doing is you're setting up a passageway on their site. Here's the other thing is my developer Cole, he's got a problem saying, hey, I can't figure this out. And I point, at, I point my client at his server, and so I can walk my code, and it hits a breakpoint in his Visual Studio, and he can walk it. So you can actually hit somebody else's Visual Studio as well. Um, Ingrok also has a website like RunScope where you can kind of see all the traffic on the backside, so you can go to the website. Oh, no, it's actually local. It creates a local store. And so you can see the history of what was called locally. Um, it's a really neat tool. I highly recommend it. It's got the services that you're back yeah, basically it's like a long pole, right? I create a connection up to the website, like a it's like signal art, it's a long pole. And so I'm listening for traffic coming to the website, and then my mobile clients are all talking out to the website. And so that traffic's leaving your network, going out to the internet, and then coming back in, and it's doing all of that over HTTP so you don't have to open up a firewall hole. Um, and all you need to do is just change your endpoint in your clients and then run that little proxy on, in that command line to, to facilitate all that traffic. Um, it's a fantastic tool. If you're doing both client and server dev and you have control of both sides, you have to have it. You, ju you just have to. Um, something else with profiling, and we do this within Conquer, um, memory leaks are a big problem, right? Everybody knows that. Even .NET can memory leak. And so what we do in all of our uh, our significant classes, not every single helper or anything like that has this, but all of our view models have this, all of our service classes have this, all of our uh, heavy data models have this. We put a little profiling uh, command directive in there, and we've set up this diagnostics logger, and we log every create, and we, uh, and then on the destructor, uh, we, we, log, we remove every single object. So what happens is we call into this diagnostics thing, it uses reflection, it gets out the full class name, and then it gets out its hash, the, the handle for that .NET object. And then what we do is we log every time something is created, and then when it gets destroyed, we call back to it saying, hey, this has been finalized, and we go in and we find the same thing with that same hash code, and we pull it out of the dictionary. And as a result, what we have is in our app, we have a little Easter egg that if you tap a certain thing in a certain sequence, it'll unlock a diagnostic screen, and we can see every single object that is still alive in memory that was created but not finalized. And you can see right here, I've got 88 of these zone view models. Hmm, that might be a problem. Um, this, is, uh, this is a great way for you to detect event handlers that were subscribed and not unsubscribed. Um, it, this one, I can tell you right now, is because the map was not garbage collecting correctly. Um, it's a problem with all mapping, that garbage collection is really sketchy with mapping. Um, but the nice thing about this is I can see, I have confidence that all of my objects are getting finalized, and if they're not, then I have a better idea of tracking down where that's coming from. Anybody get the profiler to work in Xamarin? A Android profiler? 
Really? Good. I want to talk to you about that. Um, this is a way that you'll know what's going on without having to depend on a third-party tool. That can be a real challenge to get working or not going. And then down here, um, this just tells me what time an object was created. So if I see I've got 88 of these, I can scroll down and see if I can find a block of these. But I can get an idea of what was happening around that to get an idea of, oh, I, I bet you in my constructor here, or my finalizer here, I'm not doing something. This literally took less than a day to build, and it saved my life multiple times in the last three years. Um, think about what it would take to implement your own profiler, because I bet you, if you thought about it for an evening, it wouldn't take you that long to do, because there's not a whole lot to it. You have a static class, and, and you turn it on with compiler directives, so it's not going out in production if you don't want it to. But you just call into it, use reflection, get the caller, get its hash code, put it in a dictionary, and you're good to go. Also, I can run garbage collect here. I put this button here and call the garbage collector, and I can see what this, if this changes or not. Sometimes these things are memory just because the garbage collector hasn't run yet. And so it gives me a chance uh, to kind of see what's going on. I've only ever used this once in production. I pulled this right out of my Windows phone code. I had one guy in Asia who was running on some weird phone, and I gave him the secret code to unlock this, and then I could get an idea of what was going on. Um, also, with your whole secret code, uh, what we do is we have four spots in a certain uh, part of the app, and those four, the sequence of what four spots you are supposed to tap changes every time the build number changes. So if you give it away to a user, then next build it won't work unless they get the new secret code. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think I put it in the base class in the places I had base classes. <coughs> I'm not sure. You'd have to try it. But I, it, it should get, you should use, be able to get reflection to get the instance name, so it should work just fine in the base class. As long as you make sure you call through to the constructor in the base class. If you forget to do that, then obviously it's not going to work. Um, I disposable. this is a really... Um, good thing to think about uh, as a way of, of depending on how you clean up. One of the things that you can do to make sure that you unsubscribe to all your events and you clean up all these objects that might have some native reference is to implement iDisposable. And then one of the neat things that you can do is you can um, subscribe to the event on child remove. So if you're adding and removing things from your layout all the time, all of those layouts have an on child remove event. And you can check to see, does this thing implement iDisposable? Disposable? And if it does, I'll just call iDispose. And that's an easy way to make sure that your objects are at least attempting to be reclaimed in memory. It's by implementing iDisposable yourself and then watching for that interface. Um, we do a very, we try to be very explicit about always cleaning up after ourselves. I don't trust that .NET and Xamarin are going to do the right automatic get garbage collection on iOS and on Android and on, on Windows Phone. It should. But I am a paranoid developer, um, and I've been burned too many times by things that should have worked and didn't. Um, so this is just a safety net for us. So custom renders. You guys, how many people have used custom renders? What are you using them for? What are you doing with them? Status bar is one of them recently. Okay. Status bar. That, yeah, that progress bar. Progress bar is a really good one. Anyone else? Text view. Te what, what about the text view? Oh, this is a pain in the for iOS. The fonts implementation is really bad because every platform handles fonts differently and if you want to embed a custom font in your app, which we do, um, getting the font to work the way that you want it to work can be really tricky and it's probably one of the bigger ones that we have to do is anytime we have a font involved, we have to have a custom renderer. We do custom renderers for the map as well. Um, this is an example here of the custom renderer for the map. And in, uh, the way that we implement the map is we have a container view, and it's just always empty. And we just say, this is a custom map, but there's nothing inside of it. And then we write a custom renderer that every time we're trying to render a custom map, we completely throw away whatever Xamarin passed us, which was an empty container. And in its place, we drop in an NK map on iOS or an Android map or a Windows Phone map. And we drop that map completely in place and wholesale replace it. If you're doing a custom render on a label or a text box, you probably just want to go grab it and just change the font and then put it back the way it was and not do a wholesale replacement. Um, 
this is our, our whole custom map object. You can see it does nothing. It's just, it, it implements a view, and that's it. And then we do the wholesale replacing here by putting in an MK map view, which is an iOS map. Um, I will say it with mapping, the Windows Phone map is awful. The best Bing map that has been created was Silverlight 2's Bing map. It was the most performant map. Ever since then, it's been worse. Um, and so we're actually using ArcGIS's .NET map. I've heard rumors from Xamarin that ArcGIS has got a beta for a cross-platform map. Um, I'm really excited about that. I'd like to have one map. And the ArcGIS map is insanely fast. Um, very, very good map. The problem is, is that ArcGIS uses the Mercator coordinate system. It doesn't use latitude and longitude. So you have to be smart enough to figure out how Mercator and GPS work together, and that's really hard. Um, hopefully, when they build the Xamarin map, they'll give us a GPS-based map uh, so we don't have to write all those translations. And this is what we talked about already with just grabbing out that control and just modifying. Um, oh, no, this is an Android one. Um, one of the other things that you can do with Android is you can inflate an Android UI. So you can build an AXML, an Android version of XAML, um, control. And this is our map here where we build an Android fragment, and then we just use the inflator. And so we use the layout inflator service to go get that Android map. It has these extra things in it that are just easier to do in markup. And then we just inflate that in place of um, our empty box in Xamarin. Um, style ID. The style ID is a free field to use however you want. Um, I'm a little nervous with that. I, I'm worried that that's not going to become a free field someday. Um, but we use that to determine what type of font we might want to put in this label or in this text box. Um, we have some work to do around that because uh, sometimes one of, my, one of my devs said, oh, it's a free field, and he throws something in there that's not a style. And so I need to be a little bit, we need to be a little bit more careful about having some type of a prefix that we can identify of, oh, this is referring to a font style versus um, this is some ID that, I, that, that other code is looking for when it's trying to find the object on the page. Are you worried about that being an issue when you can do automated UI testing in the future? I'm worried about that being an issue because that will implement styling, and then the style ID will mean something to Xamarin. Um, I really hope Xamarin implements a... Uh, cross-platform styling, we, we would like to do skinning in Conquer someday, and I think it would be a lot easier um, if we have a style ID that actually means something to Xamarin. Um, but today, it's just an empty field, that's like the tag field, that you can just throw anything you want in there. And I'm, I'm worried that that field's going to become meaningful someday, and it might either take away the usability we have now, or it might create a problem down the road. They, they do, that's their recommendation for UI tests, is there is that style ID. Is to identify the control? Yeah, so you label a TXT box or whatever. Yeah. So you have something to reference. So. Yeah. So, you know, it's a multi purpose field. I'm worried about the fact that it's multi purpose. Yep. Why are you using, excuse me, why are you using the style ID? So just a, a property on the, the view? Um, we could. We could create a custom view and put our own property on it. Is that what you're referring to? Well, if you're doing a render, then you've got to have something that's rendered. Yeah, we could so. just add a custom property there. Um, the difference being is that with this way, I can have common code that understands how to look for a style and say, make the foreground this color, the, the background that color, and not have to have one for each one. I can just do a view renderer, um, which you're right. And that's probably the better way to go is to just implement that custom property. We didn't. I think it was a mistake. I'm worried about other things that could happen as a result of that. Um, so this is something that we did, this, this swipey thing, right? Um, we tried a lot of different things to get the swipey thing to work. In fact, this might be the right time to switch. Hopefully we still have internet connection here. That'll make this thing a lot better. All right, so this is the new Conquer Blue um, super secret preview. Don't tell anybody, right? Um, and this is what the map looks like. And if we tap something here, this is our animation to attack. Um, and if you, if you tap one of the controls rather than swiping, it runs around and gets in there and you're ready to fight and attack. And um, this animation, really tricky to do because if I, if I swipe it, if I swing it, and then I put my finger on here, I want it to stop. Oh, Cole didn't do that. Um, we'll have to fix that. But you could say, oh, figure out the speed, figure out the rotation, and then set up a Xamarin animation, and it'll run so many seconds. 
But when you hit your finger on there, you want to stop it, right? And then, you, then it becomes a drag gesture. And so when you, when you are doing these creating animation, starting animation, stopping animation, those are things that um, can be really tricky to get right with um, a Xamarin animation that has a duration property. And so what we did here, and I'm really impressed that my, my dev Cole figured out how to do it and it works really well, is that we implemented a game loop like you would do in uh, uh, XNA or like you would do in Unity where we have a draw method and uh, there's a setup method and a draw method where 33 frames a sec, 33 milliseconds is equivalent to 30 frames a second, which is the right way to, actually I have it here on the thing. Set up a timer for 33 milliseconds, which is equivalent to 33 frames per second. And then what happens is you do a redraw every 33 milliseconds and you figure out where all of these things are supposed to be. And so what we did is because this is a simple circle, this is just um, a transform that just moves this thing in, a, in an angle. And he's got all the math worked out of how do I accelerate, how do I decelerate. Um, there's all the, all the uh, easing formulas are online. They're actually not that complicated the mathematical formulas to do cubic easing. And so we just draw 33 frames a second. And then if we ever touch the screen, which like I said, apparently isn't working with iOS, um, then we can just stop drawing because they put their finger on the screen and now you can do a drag routine or something else to draw it in a new place. Um, this turns out was a much better implementation than attempting to create an animation, stop an animation, create a new animation, stop an animation. It was much, much easier for us to just say, okay, where am I supposed to be now? Where am I supposed to be now? Every 30 milliseconds. And it, it worked out really well. So, um, and the cool thing about this, this is all Xamarin Forms. None of that was native. All that animation was Xamarin Forms, which shocked, really shocked me. I really thought that to get this type of performance, we were going to have to do a wheel on Android, a wheel on iOS. In fact, we started down that path, and then we said, well, wait a minute, this actually wasn't as hard as we thought it was going to be. We should go back and see if we can do this in Xamarin Forms. It turns out it worked really, really well. Any questions on this before I move on? Okay. Um, as long as I'm in here in the iOS, I'll show you a few other things. Um, if we launch this attack, we've got this launch animation here. Um, there's a lot of images here drawing this thing. And one of the ways that we were able to, oh, well, that wasn't very exciting. Um, let's launch again. Uh, let's go back and launch something any, better. Any player's Not yet. No players running this. Let's see if we can get a little bit better animation here. There we go. A little bit more exciting. Um, I don't know why. There should be like 15 arcs in here. Um, the way that we got this to work better was this is a ton of I.O. IO to load all these little PNGs off of the file system on the phones. And so what we do is we load up all these images into a byte array, and then we stream that byte array into an image source wherever we want it so that we're not doing any I.O. Um, this is a technique we're probably going to start doing a lot more of for all of our common icons. We're just going to hold them in a byte array in memory to speed up the UI. Um, there's a lot of issues with memory management with images on Android. Um, I don't know if you guys have run into that yet, but there is a, when we switch back, there's a Xamarin article out there, and if you haven't seen it yet, um, you should definitely go look for it, where you want to load up your larger images into a byte array and size it in memory before you give it to the UI, because Android has a really bad memory leak when it has to resize images itself. Um, and so we're, we're just starting now. In fact, I was a little nervous that I had anything to demo with you today because we went through every image that Conqueror uses in Xamarin and we built a whole new way of doing custom images and image factories so that we could take advantage of caching the images and resizing them before Android gets its fingers on it um, so that we could avoid the memory leaks. We were having a lot of out of memory exceptions and we, we feel like we've addressed a lot of those because we're now resizing images instead of letting Android do that itself. Um, so these are some of the UI elements, and I'll talk a little bit more about the implementation of those as we go. Um, you can see we're using animations. We've got some fairly aggressive lists here um, that has some custom, custom styling and list elements in it. This is our most aggressive list layout. You can see all the different elements that are in each list item. Um, list items have children, 
this is this is way beyond trying to just use the built-in list box. Um, some cases you may find that it's actually easier if you have if you know you're going to have a finite list of small things like maybe 50 things, but they're super complicated. You might get better performance by rendering them all in a stack layout and then putting them in a scroll view so they're all rendered and they're just moving up and down versus putting in a list box which will only render what's in the visible the viewport and maybe a little above and a little below. Um, that dynamic rendering can be really slow depending on how complex the thing is you're doing. But of course, if you were to display a thousand things in a list box, you wouldn't want to render all 1,000. So you have to kind of pick your battles. You have to know whether this is something I can fully render and just scroll what I rendered, or whether I have to use a dynamic renderer in a list view with a custom list item template. Did that make sense? Um, so something to think about when you're doing performance on really aggressive UI. So if you're, you have a finite list, that's not In that particular case, yeah, that was the upgrades that you can purchase in the game. There's a finite list of upgrades. Um, and then even with this list, which is the list of uh, towns and cities that are near you, we never show more than 200 on an app at a time. And so this list could never have more than 200. But I'm pretty sure we are using a standard list and a list item template here because it's fairly simplistic. We also found that if you um, use binding on a list, the performance with a bound list on an observable collection is better than drawing the list of elements one at a time um, in your own iteration loop by adding them into that control. That's not what we expected, um, but it turns out that Xamarin has, I, I don't think it was actually that way when we started this over a year ago, but I think they've tweaked their observables um, and they're getting better performance now by binding to a list rather than um, putting an element into the list yourself. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of the UI. I'm probably not gonna re-plug in this back again um, because we have to switch. But that was the Conquer, the new Conquer UI. Uh, here's my advice on navigation. Uh, any of you that are native Android developers build single activity applications? Nobody? Where you have one activity and you're just changing the view in that activity all the time? Um, I, I found that that model seems to work very well for us in Xamarin and other forms where you're, we're okay. Um, where you basically have one page and you change the view on top of that page um, a lot. Because uh, navigation page and you might skip a page or hit the back button and the page is still rendering, but now that control is trying to modify is now gone. And so you get all these weird invalid object exceptions, which always turn into some type of a crazy Java stack trace, which you really never know what generated that, um, those problems. Um, if you build a single activity application, which was all the rage about two years ago for a lot of Android developers, um, then you can avoid some of those instantiation issues as you're navigating, especially when you're dealing with the back button. We built our own navigation manager, uh, so every pop-up, every page that stacks on top of another page um, is managed by our own navigation manager. It knows how to tear that down, so we have our own navigation stack. Um, we also have pop-ups that could pop up for any given reason in the app that could be pushed by a push notification or some background polling service that's running. And whenever that pop-up pops up, um, it, we manage that. And the reason why we do that is because with Windows Phone, you're required to have a back button turned on a pop-up. It's part of the certification requirement. And that can be a really tricky thing to do unless you have really iron-fisted control over it. And uh, so we decided that we were just going to do our own UI management layer and manage our own navigation stack. And so um, think about that. Think about how you're going to manage pop-ups. Think about how you're going to add um, details that lay up over top and how that's going to work with the back button. Because if you start uh, building your app uh, the way that you build an iOS app and then you try to do back button stuff, you, you may struggle. Um, so think about that ahead of time. I know this is a big wall of text, um, but it's one of the things that we ended up doing halfway through because our first implementation was suffering. And so we said, screw that. Forget about uh, Xamarin's navigation stack. Let's manage it ourselves. Scott, how do you deal with that uh, fact, though, that if you do what is called Android for they take off back buttons generally, right? And then you go to iOS. So what, what does that look like for you on iOS? Uh, we have a back button in every UI, even if you're on an Android or a Windows phone. That was a battle that I kind of gave up on. I really wanted to have our UI have no back buttons on the UI. 
Um, because a lot of Android and Windows Phone people are kind of like, oh, so this is just some cheap port of some crappy iOS app, and because you didn't even bother to take out back buttons. Um, I, I had to go back and forth with my developers quite a bit so that we were doing back in a state that seemed more gamey and not just the standard back up on the top left corner. And so in some places, we do have that back button is where you would normally look for it. But it feels like it blends into the app and is not just Chrome. Um, we, we, we could remove the button. And if, if the only thing on the top of our app was a button, then I would probably have that collapse down depending on my platform. Um, but, in, but in most cases, my, de my designer did a great job of kind of blending that into the spot so that removing it would really just leave a hole because there's other things around it. And it, we might as well just leave it if that's the case. Um, here's an important one. UI thread, especially if you're going to build your own MVVM framework, which uh, we do. And I can explain why we do that if you want. Um, it's very important, especially in Android. And, and in some cases, on Windows Phone, whether you, that you know whether you're running on the UI thread or not, uh, mapping is a really, really, really hard thing to get to make performance. Um, iOS doesn't really care a lot of times whether it's on the UI thread or not. It just kind of works. Um, where Android absolutely, and Windows Phone too, um, it's very important in some cases to be on the UI thread and very critical in other places never to be on the UI thread um, if you don't want your UI to freeze up and stutter. And so uh, we sprinkle all throughout our code, especially when we're developing, checks to make sure am I on the UI thread or not. And a lot of times we'll wrap that in that, that uh, profiling tag so that we can optionally take that out when we build for production. But this is how you would do it. In iOS, you ask monotouch.foundation.nsthread.isName. It's pretty simple. Uh, on Android, you have to say androidos.looper.myLooper is equivalent to androidos.looper.mainLooper. So you check to see um, that one. This is the really insane one. Windows Phone, now this is the universal app framework, not Silverlight. Um, Windows.applicationmodel.core.coreapplication.mainview.corewindow.dispatcher.hasthreadaccess. Um, I had to use Twitter to get that one. I asked, I couldn't find it, and somebody tweeted me back and said, here you go, this is how you do it. Um, yeah, well, they said um, you have to have core application.mainview.core window, and so I was able to trace back how to get that at the top level. Um, but when you're, when you're in that final stage and you're trying to get your app out the door and your UI is stuttering on Android and you're just really suffering with why is this so awful, um, this can be a lifesaver of putting code in to say verify I'm on the UI thread and just put it a system.debugger.break, you know, debugger code that it's not a breakpoint that is in the dev, it's in code. Um, in fact, we do this right here. If uh, is on main thread and my debugger is attached, go ahead and break so that that's how I verify I'm on the background thread or verify I'm on the UI thread. I have this code throughout and because when I build for production, my debugger is never attached, that code's mostly inaccurate. Um, it, you know, it takes up more space in your zap, but who cares? Um, what we found out, and the big reason why uh, this will be in a later slide here, the timer on Android runs on the background thread. So does what it's called. The timer on, Android, on Xamarin runs on the UI thread. And all this code, I had no idea was running on the UI thread until I put that stuff in. And so don't make assumptions. I mean, it's hard not to make assumptions. But we found that we had this huge issue with the UI redrawing. It had everything to do with the fact that we had switched to the Xamarin timer that was cross-platform, Xamarin Forms timer that was cross-platform away from our native timers. And it moved our thread, and we didn't know that. We didn't know we were running on the UI thread as a result. Um, use factories and custom controls uh, for fancy buttons. We don't have a single button in our app. It's all an image with a tap gesture. Um, and so with cross-platform stuff, you really have to pull down to the bare bones of just a container, a view, a stack layout with images or backgrounds or stuff inside. And you don't get the click events. You've got to implement tap gestures. Um, but you can, you can do that pretty well. And my advice is, and you may disagree, no, no uh, religious offense intended here, but if you're married to MVVM or MVC, you'll, you might get some frustrating nights and weekends trying to get things to work. Um, we use a, a mix uh, of binding and uh, control, and uh, we, we did the thing that worked the best for us. 
Um, there's lots and lots of frameworks out there to make uh, things easier. I heard MVV and Cross as an example. Um, easy things are easy for easy apps and often become a problem in hard apps. Um, it's been my experience almost always that if you didn't write it, you'll probably spend more time debugging around it. Most frameworks can be built in a weekend um, or, or a couple of days of where you'll spend at least that much time debugging over three years trying to w figure out why an upgrade to MVVM Cross or um, some ILC container uh, now has your app working something different. In Conquer, we use the service locator pattern um, because it's more uh, flexible than dependency injection. Uh, I'll give you a good example of that. In our app, which is around a big app, it has a lot of assets, uh, we can make our service locator decide, hey, should I give you a new one of these or reuse the one I created five minutes ago? And it can decide when a new one is needed and when uh, a reuse is okay. Where um, that can be a really tricky thing to configure with IOC and you don't get that level of control in order to do memory cleanup or management or all, any of those other things. And quite frankly, I know some people hate service locator pattern and it's the devil and it's evil and uh, IOC and DI is the only way to build uh, apps the right way. Um, but I've been burned by this too many times to not have that control. And so think about that as well. Think about um, are you doing this? Um, I'll come back to that. There's another slide here. But think about are you using a best practice because you're still practicing as a developer because you know that's the right thing for your app? Using a best practice because you know it's the right thing, fantastic, that's awesome. Um, I find that too many devs are using best practices because they just don't know any better. Um, don't be that person. You know, know that a best practice is the right thing for your situation and do the right thing for your app at that time. Um, we have all this hacker stuff in there. I'll come back to that some other time, maybe after the recording stops. I don't want to give my players a roadmap of how to get around our stuff. Um, we use an obfuscator called Babel. Anybody heard of Babel obfuscator? Um, here's why I really like Babel. I can obfuscate lower level assemblies, have it kick out a map, import that map into the higher level assembly, and therefore I can obfuscate all of my public methods and properties into crazy names that nobody will ever be able to understand. And I can really expose almost nothing publicly in my app across multiple projects in a solution. Um, that's why I chose Babel. It's also a very, very cost effective. Um, you could buy, I think, eight Babel licenses, enterprise Babel licenses for the price of one Dotfuscator license. Um, and support's amazing. Alberto and his wife own this company in Italy. Every time I've had a question, he gets back to me within 24 hours. Sometimes I actually have gotten on Skype with him a couple of times in the middle of the night for me. Um, but uh, small business uh, works really hard for good customer support and has done uh, good things. Um, I've, I've never used an obfuscator that didn't take a week to figure out. Uh, and Babel is no exception. Um, it's got its little quirks, it's got its little funny business. Um, I've dealt with some very, very rude support people at Obfuscator, and I've had amazing support from uh, Alberto at, at Babel. And so I can't say enough nice things about him, and I try to promote his product when I can. Um, decrypting text, you know, Obfuscator, by default, a lot of Obfuscators will encrypt text. Um, you know, don't, don't, I, I would never recommend encrypting text that the user is going to see anyway, unless it's going to give you a hint into some fancy code that you want to protect. Um, we obfuscate absolutely everything we can obfuscate in that lower client code, that, that pure PCL code. We have to be careful about what we obfuscate around Xamarin because we've seen some issues with obfuscating controls, UI stuff, where Xaml kind of gets messed up as a result. Um, but if you break up your project, you can say, apply every single thing you can possibly obfuscate to that pure .NET code. And because Babel allows you to map it, you can say, even obfuscate my public methods and properties. And so there's nothing in there that looks like English. And then you import that map to that top level project, and now it knows what all the new signatures look like that are, that are still public, but they have new names now. Um, and a big tip here, this is hard to find this, but if you use Unicode obfuscation, it won't work for Android. Android, you can't use the Unicode character set when you obfuscate on Android. I lost several days on that the first time around. Um, I kind of already mentioned all this stuff. Uh, we use, we build our UI and the code behind. Um, we set up binding manually. We don't bind with the, uh, with the, um, we don't bind with the XAML because we don't do XAML. So we create the control and then we do binding. Uh, we create the control, we build our page, and then we set up all the binding. We don't bind as we build um, so that we have that separation. Um, 
all of our testable code is in the view models. So yes, we're in the code behind. A lot of people think that's really awful. Um, but we don't really have any logic to test in the code behind. It's mostly construction and binding. Um, you'll also have some things potentially with your uh, notify property change that you can sometimes, uh, depending on your platform, say this has to raise a UI thread and this one doesn't because iOS doesn't care. And so you're not doing that thread marshalling on iOS that you have to do on other apps. Um, this is my thing about how, you know, know your best practices. At Carker, we always build for execution. I know a lot of people build for testability. Uh, with resources as tight as they are on a mobile platform, um, we always build for execution and we figure out how to test. And uh, you're only paranoid if you're wrong. So that's Conquer. Um, any questions? I know that was a lot, and I don't know how helpful that was, but we've learned a lot the last three years trying to do, well, the last year doing Xamarin Forms. We're, we think we're pretty close to being ready to release, uh, but we're still finding things to get performance up. Do you have a target release date? Nope. I'm a developer. <laughs> I'm the CEO, but I'm a developer first. <laughs> Do you keep track of the ages of the players? Demographics? Yeah. Our, demogra our 35 to 45 year old males pay our bills. Um, but I have a 17 year old girl in Florida who basically runs her faction for Florida. Um, she has a lot of old guys listening to her tell them what to do. Um, and I have a 16 year old grandma in California who owns Sal in California, and she tells people what to do. Um, these, these people organize themselves and see each other in reality? Uh, like we've, had a player, we've had a player um, who lives in London vacation with a family in California he had never met before except for through the game. I don't know about anybody getting married yet through Conquer, um, but I do know that I've had several instances where a boyfriend and girlfriend broke up and one switched vaccines to fight against the other. <laughs> um, so we, we've had that happen. How many users from you have? Um, I don't talk about users because users are a really bad number for us because most people think about users in terms of the two-week engagement. And with our engagements being so long, it's a multiplier of 10. Um, we had over, we, we're approaching over half a million downloads. I'll give you that, but I'm not going to tell you what our daily actives are because the, the numbers just don't make sense and it's it's not. I throw a number out there, and the next thing you know, you know, bad stuff. She's that, now I'm the CEO. Go ahead. Do you use anything like Raygun or Xamarin Insights? Um, we use we were using Xamarin Insights, and I had to pull it out because it was causing my Windows phone to crash. Uh, I reported it to the Insights team, um, but I pulled it out. It, uh, we're still using it on the Android, and we're getting crash logs as a result of that. But the um, hockey app has has crash logging and all that stuff too. And so right now I've got that turned on, and I'm trying that out. I like Insights, um, but having it crash my app was a problem for me. So I'm not. We'll we'll try it again. I, I'm gonna I'm curious to see what this hockey app does. Where and, is it? Oh, go ahead. Would you have started down the Xamarin Forms road if you had to do it over again? And, and any regrets about not trying to go kind of get that common code base sooner? I definitely would not have tried Xamarin sooner. Um, so, you're, so you're waiting for Forms? Uh, so did Forms tell we went to We went to Evolve to try to determine if this was something we wanted to do. And then when they announced it Evolve that Forms was coming, um, so Cole and I went. And this is literally first night in the hotel room, oh my god, this is going to save us so much time. Second night in the hotel room, this doesn't work. We can't do this. Third night in the hotel room, yeah, we can, yeah, this is, this is going to work. Later today, that day at lunch, no, no, we can't do it. And then the last night that we were there before we called, Cole said, look, I will make this work. I will figure this out. And so when you see that determination out of a junior dev who's willing to take that on, yeah, okay. Um, I, this is what I say about Xamarin and Xamarin Forms is that you will not save any time building your app the first time. I, I really think that. Um, you, you guys may have experience that, that shows you that that's not true, but we were building something very challenging from a UI perspective as well. Um, I do believe in my heart that it will save us a ton of time in maintenance. Um, right now, with just Windows Phone and iOS, we basically ignore all of the bugs that come out on Android because it's a beta and it, like I said, just never had confidence with it to begin with. And we just kind of say, hey, it's a beta. But with iOS and Windows Phone, 
it's amazing the things that just don't quite work the same, that should work the same, and just don't. Um, and that's really challenging. Uh, Apple's never had an uh, iOS update that had backwards compatibility. We have a bug right now where they changed, I don't know if you guys know this, they changed the NS date formatter. And now our dates don't format right sometimes. Um, sometimes. And so, um, you know, it's weird things like that, that uh, mind switching between code platforms is really tricky. I mean, this whole company, this huge cloud platform, these three mobile devices and two developers, and I'm one of them, and I have to do everything else. Um, I don't think we could, we couldn't do that with two developers on all three, all three platforms in the cloud. So, yes, it was the right decision for us. Did it take us a hell of a lot longer than I thought it would? Absolutely, it did. Um, do I think we saved any money? I'm not sure yet, but I think we will. Is that an okay answer? That's I mean, does that answer. make sense to everybody? Yeah. Um, we, I expected, we've been working on this for just about a year. And we, to be fair, we did take about two or three months off to go fix the API to support all the new stuff. So it wasn't a full year on Xamarin. But a year to build a mobile app is insane to me as a developer. That's absurd. But yet that's what it has taken. Um, it probably would have taken us that long or longer to build three mobile apps, uh, one on each platform. And it certainly would have taken more than two people. So, yeah, it, it, didn't, it wasn't as fast as everyone thought it would be. And in fact, if you talk to Xamarin now and you say, here's what we want to do, they would never recommend that we try to use forms because we're trying to do something that really probably shouldn't do. Um, I would have really loved to have been Unity. At the time, there was no map control for Unity that you would ever bet your revenue on. Um, now there looks like there might be some mapping coming out for Unity. I am not starting over. I'm not starting over again. Um, but we had to be Xamarin instead of Unity because of we're a map-based game. So I made the best worst decision there could be made. It was really hard. Um, hard things are hard to do. Are you satisfied with the progress that you've seen from Xamarin? With Xamarin? Um, no, I, I'm not. I, I'm really frustrated that we don't have a UI designer. Um, I think that's Xamarin's biggest Achilles heel right now is that we don't have a UI designer. We spend way, way too much time running our app to get to the page that's having a problem to try something and then go back up and then run it again to see if, is this the right padding? Is this the right margin? Is this the right font size? That's way too ineffective and it costs me way too much money not to just have a UI designer. Um, and Sketches is not nowhere near good enough. Because if you're doing all out of the box text boxes and controls, yeah, sure, use sketches. But for us, everything's a custom control, and sketches just doesn't work for us. So what about Reveal App? Is Reveal App helping you out there? Um, our biggest issues are on Android. So, no. I mean, it's, I like Reveal App. It's done some good things for us when we need it. We, spend mo uh, we do most of our development on Android. Because it turns out if it runs on Android, it kind of just runs on Windows Phone and iOS. Um, that's just kind of the nature of Android. And um, unfortunately, it's a least common denominator type of situation too, right? You have to make the best with. I can't. Let me. Not, let me try not to swear. Um, but you know, you have to pull it down to. If I did it to work on Android, I'm pretty sure I did it to work everywhere else. And it is the biggest challenge we have. And I know a lot of it has to do with, I know we're still doing too much on the UI thread. I know we're still having memory management issues, mostly with images, because we have so many images. It frustrates me as a Windows Phone developer that we don't have Vector on Android, and I have to have PNGs for everything. Um, but those are just kind of things you deal with if you want to be a single code base and 95 to 98% reusability. You do with what you can. What are you using for image manipulation? Um, there's a there's an article here that is out on the Xamarin forums. Actually, we got it from our support guy on Xamarin. Uh, wait, my mouse is in the wrong one. If I can find the title, then you can at least write the title down, and you'll know what to search for. Uh, this is the address. This is ngrok. Where did I do with it? Dang it. Um, here we go. This is it. Load large bitmaps efficiently. Search for that, and you'll find all this, the recipe here for how you load it into memory, and then you manipulate it before you give it to Android. Um, 
But apparently this is a very well understood issue with Android, is that if you don't have your image sized just the way you want them, and how could you possibly, because who knows what the screen size is gonna be, um, this is a, a good way. So we're planning, we, we're just starting this now this week. Um, we're gonna start loading our images into memory, manipulating them in memory, and we might even start caching them in an byte array so that we're not doing that I.O. to storage. Um, we think that'll help us a lot with memory issues and with speed. Uh, because we have so many images in our app because we don't have any vectors, um, which is super frustrating. There are some vector stuff now. In fact, I learned it at one of those meetings to do simple vectors. So we might start doing some of our basic shapes that are just kind of button outlines and stuff. But those are pretty small PNG spots anyway, so it's not that big of a deal to have them still be PNG. And then we only have one way to draw DUI. Granted, it's all the PNGs, but it's still simpler code. Question for you. So when you say that you're caching these images into a byte array, are you putting them all into the same byte array? We, it'll or be a dictionary. Yeah. We have an okay. enum. Every image in our app is represented by a single enum type. So we go to the image factory and we say, get me an image. And it returns a custom image control um, because that custom image control has got extra flags on it so that our Windows Phone renderer can turn off hit testing so that the taps will go through in some cases. Um, so Android, there's something else we do with Android in the native thing with the image that we had to do a custom render. Um, <coughs> so, so we have a factory that kicks out a custom image and so some of the stuff happens in the factory, like image selection happens in the factory and whether the factory would decide if it's cached or not. And then what comes out of that is a custom image control but then has some other things that the renderers can, can manage. Have you ever heard of Akavash? No. Caching libraries. Okay. Uh, I don't know. How do you spell it? A K A V A C H E, I think. Something like that. C H E. Akavash. Back all beds. Yeah, check that out. Uh, I don't know if it'll help you in what you're trying to do, but it, uh, it's a pretty powerful caching library for just about anything and everything. Okay. We've been playing around with it a little I bit think I, I may have seen that recently, actually. <coughs> there was a caching library that I ran into someplace when we were trying to figure this out. Okay. It's got some damage in Clippy. Oh, maybe that's where I saw it then. Yeah, go ahead. What are you doing for local storage and syncing and environment security API? No, we have local storage. We're using um, Xamarin File Store, the Xamarin one. Um, we're not using SQLite. Again, I'm super scared of heavy frameworks. Um, and the SQLite database, I mean, it's way more than we need. We just serialize the JSON. We're only using local storage um, to store state between sessions. That's all we're doing with local storage. We don't cache any server data yet down. Um, part of that is because if we turn off the recording, I'll tell you some stuff about Packers. Um, but part of that is because I don't want to have anything locally stored that could be manipulated in a bad way. And part of it is I just want to always call back to the server to make sure things are up to date. We're, I mean, we have a, a pretty robust API, and I haven't worried about traffic yet. Um, I have had some players who have said, I can definitely tell when my husband's playing copper because our data plan goes, you know. Um, but what I could cache is not going to change that too much. Could we take a few minutes? I would love to hear some of your... About hacker? About you have to turn off the recording now. <laughs>